and God knows I have never seen. Now, I'm not like that lady from over in uh, the, the islands <laughs> in the Philippines. Yeah. I didn't have any place to put them. <laughs> but I'll guarantee there are not many people in the world who have. Uh, it's a disgrace. Yeah. Shoes in the attic. <laughs> Dear Lord, shoes in the closet. Shoes in the smokehouse. Shoes, shoes, shoes. And I can still get them on. If I lined them up, they'd go around this house. I'd rather, I mean, outside. <laughs> well, I believe you told me that when you graduated from high school, that the reason you didn't go to college is you didn't have but one pair of shoes. I didn't. I didn't have but one pair of shoes, and I couldn't go. You couldn't go I had, I, had col I had scholarships. I couldn't afford to go to school, and my mother could not make money enough to send me. But the scholarships weren't enough to pay you either, was The it? scholarships were not enough to cover. You would have to have your own things. Mm -hmm. But if I had to do that again, I would not lose eight years of struggling when I could have, I could have found work. I finally found work, and I worked my way through college. I worked for Dr. Farrington, who was very, very wealthy. And I could read scales mm -hmm. and ounces and know how to measure and prepare mm -hmm. his food. Mm -hmm. Made good money. Yeah. But you, you, when we're little country girls and little country boys and we've never been in a place, we are afraid of out there. Oh, yeah. And it's dangerous. Yes, it's yes. still dangerous right now. But I got something that made me from here... She taught these all she could, including the white ones and the black ones. And this one worked for Miss Mamie and learned and listened and came back and taught her sisters what she had heard the little girls, white girls learning. And in turn, Mamie told them things that she recalled from Virginia yeah. found that she came from there, that way. Uh -huh. And down through Mama Ellen. Mama Ellen was so meek and sweet and quiet. I never heard her, you know, I never knew the relationship of my mother here and my grandmother other than my mother loved her so much. Uh -huh. She looked after her to the final end. And but she insisted, my mother, that I do all I could with those books as long as she could help me. Do you know I finally reached her level in books about the third or fourth grade and she couldn't tell me words anymore. Therefore, you know what it did to me? It made me want to do more and I'd go back and carry it to her. So. Isn't that great? Oh, we had a, oh, that was my friend. That was my friend. She was my friend, and I did for her as long as she lived. She took you as far as she could, as and then you went back and got her and brought her with you. I did. Now that, that is it. And huh? she had so much native intelligence. Yeah. She was a very strong woman in, in Christianity, too. She believed in right and didn't mind telling you. She'd tell you, you're wrong. You're wrong. You know, you don't tell anybody they're wrong now. You get knocked down. <laughs> but Mama thing. didn't care. Mama would tell you you could like it or lump it because Josephine's going to tell you what she thought was right and what she thought was wrong. And she said, don't make the mistake that I made with my life. Uh -huh. I can tell you. So I learned so much from her. Oh, there was nothing that I couldn't talk with her. Do you know if that same relationship was with people today and their children, there would be a better world? But everybody's so busy now, Bob. They're, they're too busy to take time out and sit with a boy and tell him about life. Yeah. There's two mothers too busy. She's too tired from coming in from a job to sit with a daughter and see what her experiences were today. The kids are going to learn from somebody. They're you better believe it. And right quick, you're taken into a group. That's right. Because we grouped in my day. Yeah. But let me tell you about that group. 
I was never so indebted to a group that I could not reach out over here for a friend or a girl that was standing alone and didn't have a little playmate. I'm proud of that. I like that. If she didn't have a friend, I'd see that she had somebody's hand to hold mine. Couldn't and if I could see that she did not have anything to eat, I shared this biscuit that Mama had made, and it was had a sausage ball in it. I'd give her half of it. Can't go further than that, can you? Yeah, I like that. I, and I didn't do it. I didn't need to do it. I didn't have to do it. That's a good thing to share. That lady up here said. You share with each other, and you don't be jealous of each other, and you help one another. Oh, I can see these two sitting with their heads together, Aunt Judy and Ellen. They were just like two little old dolls, just a talking at, and they'd laugh, and I'd sit around and listen to what they were saying. I was always a good listener. You wouldn't believe it now, but I can listen. Well, you heard enough back then. You, you better share it with us now. You, you ain't no need of keeping it. Just let it all pour out. <laughs> if you wouldn't talk to us now, you'd be selfish. You, you're not a selfish person, no, so therefore these, you're sharing it. These two were very close. Mm -hmm. Now, Uncle Alf was spoiled because he was a baby boy. Uh -huh. Aunt Belle wasn't spoiled, and she was a baby girl. And you know she wasn't selfish at all? That lady was so good to me. It's so good to me. I have a chair, and it, it's sitting back here. I would show it to you. That meant a lot in my life, and um, how children learn to accept what you have and work for that. Mine, you see, I stayed with her a lot uh -huh. because my mother did not marry my natural father. Okay. Okay, you get this story? I've got it. Right. So I was shifted around. I was shifted here to my grandparents, my Grandma Ellen and Grandpa Bob Grinton. I stayed with them a lot. I always had a home. And they kept me until I was ready to go to school. And I, they did not want to turn me loose, so my mother... Josephine could bring me up here to Wilkesboro from Parks Grove to go to school. They said no and wanted to bring a lawsuit against my mother because she's taking her own child home <laughs> to keep. <laughs> and that was pretty sad. Yeah, it was. But my mother did the best thing. After all, it was the best thing because they could not have sent me to school from where they live so far away. And there was no love, no less love here than was there. But they loved me, they loved me too much. They yeah. let you get away with anything. You, a, a child needs guidance. Oh yeah. Grandparents are very precious and they, they you know, okay. It's just a little child. Yeah. No, the little child needs training. Warning you, train him when he's young. Right. And that lady kept me. She never spanked me. Ain't Bell. Never. She'd keep me while my mother worked. Uh -huh. And I would stop that. It was just like being at home. You didn't know that you weren't supposed to go in and eat up everything or whatever. And I stayed with this one, Aunt Lily. Aunt Lila's children and I were very close in playing together, but I didn't stay. Aunt Lila had all she could handle. Her hands were filled. I, I would go to see these for a week. That one's named Elizabeth. We were very good friends. And I never got to know little Clara. And these I still love. These were my close friends. These are my cousins I dearly love. No, I never made any difference in my family. I used to look after these. Ain't lose kids. They wouldn't do much for taking care of themselves or fighting for themselves. But boy, I'd sail a rocks for them. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? They still know that. I'd go to war for them in a minute. They still love them. So, I, I tell, let me tell you something else about my clothes. 
I always had plenty, plenty of clothing, just blessed because my mother went to work for the families in North Oaksboro. And there was one lady named Mrs. Floyd Johnson. Mrs. Floyd Johnson and those were very rich because he owned Texaco. And my mother would go there to do laundry. Then she would go to Mr. Ella's, which was Mr. Zolly, Mr. Zolly Ella's. And Mrs. Ella had a daughter about my size. And when I would go with my mother, I played with that little girl. Her name was Dare Ella. And she married, I've seen her husband over here in Belks or Pennies, one of those stores. And she's still around someplace. And I, every time I see him, I ask about her. But her mother would have, that little white girl had so many clothes that she would give many of them to my mother to pay her for the laundry. Instead of giving them as a gift, she gave them as payment. Payment. Naturally, your mother had to take them, but I guess in a way she needed them too, didn't she? Surely, you? she needed them, but I didn't need that many. No. Because Dara was a little taller than I, and mother always put these tucks. I've seen so many tucks. I was the tuck in this girl, tucked up this girl you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and when she'd go to Mrs. Floyd Johnston, mm -hmm. they had a big two-story house and a basement, and she had a daughter, and her name was Kathleen. And Kathleen's clothes were just perfect up here, mm -hmm. but they went on forever. They were so long. So <laughs> there would come some more tucks. My mother would roll that tuck up and tuck it and tuck it and tuck and, and sew these things around there. But the closet was filled with clothes, beautiful clothes. And do you know, that was the wrongest thing that could have ever happened to me because I never know when to stop with clothes. I'd buy it if I had to hang it on the porch. <laughs> the closet was full? To all the closet, hush, hush, don't talk about it. <laughs> running out the closets. It's still running out and still buying. I buy, and I say, Lord, forgive me for being like this because I don't mean to just be ungrateful. Now I have begun to get them organized cleaned and packed and they're to be given if anybody would oh they're well worth it don't tell me some well, of the best your mother could have used the money a lot more and better than she could have used the used clothing could we needed the money you needed the money I mean, it's nice to have the hand down clothes but much is much <laughs> money is money yeah and do you know you could buy a loaf of bread for a nickel and a box of sardines uh -huh. for a nickel. Uh -huh. And when she would get paid 50 cents to do these laundries, one or two, see she had many, many places to go wash. So she was there washing at seven o'clock uh -huh. and would be finished with that one by 9.30 and go over to the next job and some jobs would pay her. Uh -huh. And then they could all of these people meet back down at Mr. TV Paul's. That was his name. Mr. TV Paul ran a taxi, mm -hmm. and they would get in this taxi and ride for 10 cents apiece. Mm -hmm. Come back home. Come back home, want a dime. How about that? And then we'd get out at the store, because uh -huh. I knew Mama was going to buy that loaf of bread uh -huh. and that box of sardines. And uh, a nickel's worth of coffee or whatever. Yeah. And we would go home and make mix up this uh, sardines and eat half that loaf of bread. That was a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, the memories, the memories. You know, um, Bob, I guess the only whipping that I ever got in my life, only whipping, I didn't get them. I managed somehow to get around that. I don't know how I did it. And I deserted it many times, I'm sure. I guess I could talk my way out of it. But my mother was going to town and I wanted to go. And she wouldn't let me go, so I ran out with my gown on in the on the back porch and jumped up and down and screamed and screamed and she was way out the road out there. And she came back and gave me one. <laughs> one to remember. One to remember. That was the only one she ever gave me. <laughs> 
and then I would make her feel so terrible because I'd tell her because she, you know, wouldn't let me go someplace or wouldn't let me have whatever I wanted or give me her last dime. I tell her, well, when I'm dead and lying in the coffin and you pass by, don't cry. <laughs> that was so mean. I did. I did that. I got away with it. But now, that isn't nice to tell, is it? Well, it's the truth, and it's the way you grew up, and the way you handled the situation. <laughs> I handled it real well. Well, uh, I got what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and tell it like it is. You haven't done bad, Liv Grinton. You haven't done bad at all for it. not only yourself, but what I mean is your family and your people. Uh, you got out of high school. You got married, I presume, pretty quickly. I have yeah, well said. All right. Then, what did you do in that period between then and when you went to college to get your degree? You worked, I guess? I worked two jobs or three jobs a day. Excuse me, I didn't sleep in on the jobs. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a very rough time because we were very poor, didn't have anything, and we were just beginning. And our parents couldn't give us but just so much. They shared what they had. The people were so wonderful to share with us, too, what they had. Because when we got married in 1935, um, I still have some presents that are very delicate, very beautiful things that people gave. They got the money from somewhere. And we were so blessed with a start. And then we lived in a house. We moved out. It was, it was the thing to do. We stayed with... Uh, his parents, Brack's parents, Mama and Papa Rob, for a year. Then we got us a house that was an old house, and it was so old. And if the, we were on the modern day, you'd say, how old was it? <laughs> I would say, it was old and so ragged that you put these buckets and things underneath to catch the water that was dripping down, mm -hmm. and it would sound like a musical festival. <laughs> ting, 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 all night long the water dripped. And I'm not too sure, but I think it was dry where we slept, but cold, oh my God. And it was not mice or one mouse, it was rats big ones up in the loft yeah. that were known as wharf rats. Mm -hmm. They were so big that on the back porch we had a shelf that we could set milk and things to keep. Mm -hmm. And I went to get the milk one afternoon and do you know when I reached up there was this creature looking at me <laughs> and his face was that long, that snout and he had big eyes and the ears sticking up, but he didn't have any hair. He was a wolf rat. And you know what the devil had done? What? He had taken the top off the milk and had been drinking out of the milk bucket. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So I said, well, now I've seen it all because that devil's going to bite me. He turned around and went back up into that up an attic up there. I went to town and bought one of those traps that was about so long and you had to cock it like a gun. Uh -huh. That wire across there was this thick, you know, across this thing. It was so long and so wide. And I cocked that thing and held it down with my hands and put a huge piece of meat on there. Open this trap you know, where the, move the milk, and set that thing where the milk was. He came down, got on that thing to get the cheese, and it hit him halfway and had his body like this. That didn't stop him. He went back up in the attic with the trap halfway across him. Mm. And you'd hear, boom, boom, boom. Blop, blop, blop. He was up there jumping up and down trying to get that trap off and that thing wouldn't come off. And I called some people and they came and went up there and had to take the gun 
and he jumped at them with the trap halfway across here. Good. That a mean dude, wasn't it? Mean dude? Nothing. That's what I had to live with. You talk about mean. <laughs> You, oh, you don't know. Oh. Dear God, to have lived like that. And I thought, we'll have to find a better way. So we began then to struggle to see if we couldn't get a loan. And we went to Judge Hayes, Judge Johnson J. Hayes, and he helped us. This house that you're looking at right here, one, two, three, Four, five, that's the rooms. We had five rooms. We built this house like 19, 40, 41, like 40, 1941. We got married in 1935. 35, that would have given us five years there and over there. 40, okay? When the house was finished, because Brack was a carpenter and his daddy was a carpenter, and he got Uncle Roby Anderson to help him. And they built the house, and I did a lot of the helping to put up the panel that you see in this room mm -hmm. right here now mm -hmm. that I did. I couldn't do the ceiling, but I could do things on the floor. And we worked as hard as we could. And by doing so much work ourselves, and his father being a carpenter, we built this house for $800. Eight, $800. $800. Mm -hmm. $800 was the total bill. But still, back in 1940, 800 was pretty hard to come by in a way. Oh, well, Lord, that was funny. That was just as hard as your... Uh, 20, 30,000? 30,000 or 50,000 dollars now. Yeah. But $800 for yeah. this, and it still stands when the gentleman took out the... Um, uh, underpinning brick mm -hmm. that had been done when this house was built. They had to take it out because it didn't meet the standard mm -hmm. for now. Mm -hmm. I shed tears because I hated to see it go. Oh, yeah. Just the underpinning around. And then they put in the cinder box because that's what the law required. Yeah. But those were beautifully done. Oh, yeah. And had been standing all those years, 40, 50, 60, 70. We've been married 51 years this Christmas. 51. So that how this house has been here uh, 45 years. 45? Yeah. 45, 45 years. All of it. Every yeah. bit of it. And uh, it, it's still in good shape. The floors are hardwood. That you don't see. Uh -huh. The paneling, white pine paneling. And it, it has aged and darkened with age. Yeah. Now I have one room there that has never had a brush on it. Natural. It, natural. It's just natural. Yeah. And that one is natural except we had some satin finish put on it one time. And yeah. back in my back bedroom is a, a pine, mm -hmm. all pine ceiling. I would not have it any other way. And this has been such a great treat. Mm -hmm. I do hope you will help me and stay with oh, me until we can oh, yeah. get all of these and I'll share it with you. Oh. I've still got to ask you another question. Now. Yes. When, when did you go to college? I went to college in, well, I came out of, in 35, and I stayed out eight years. That was 43. Uh -huh. I went to college in 1943, uh -huh. and I had Breck's sister live there, and her daughters were in school, and they helped me and shared with uh -huh. me, and I worked. Where did you go? Winston-Salem State. Okay. It was Winston-Salem State College right. then, uh -huh. state teachers. Right and took that and did very well. You knew you had to do something, didn't you, to, to bring yourself on up? I had never given up. That's what I mean. I, I don't give up. If there's something you want to do, I don't believe in giving up. I think you should keep it. You might not be able to do it today, yep. but don't put it away forever. Right. Look ahead, and it's far range in your mind. I'll get there. Don't give up. You cannot do everything at once. Young people are apt to feel, I need it now. Right. You do, but if you can't do it now, take, your, take it step by step. But don't give up that dream. There's nothing like having 
something in your mind that you want to become, and you can do it. Don't tell me. <laughs> How many years did you teach school? 31. 31 years. 31. Well, I was 28 years old when I went to college. Uh -huh. 28. 28 years And I went with the feeling of knowing that I had to do something and prove to myself I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a doctor. I just didn't have the time nor the money to do that. I lost that because of money and time. You had to have that fee. You had to do your internship. And I would have been gone away from home. So it wasn't a lost cause. No, no. I, I was able to do many things with my life. Well, in your teaching, uh, Lib, you, you probably, in one sense, done more than you could probably ever done as a doctor. Look how many lives you touched and uh, used your knowledge to help that child learn. In the sense where you see what I'm driving at? Yes. A doctor heals people that are sick and gets them well, and then he goes on and heals other people. Yes. But you were teaching, and you were teaching young children, and they were coming on up and no telling what all you influenced life, their lives, other people's lives, That's right. and this type of thing. So in my way of looking at it, I think it was, the Lord knew what he was he, doing. He knew. He gave me the direction, and right. I couldn't change it. Right. But let me tell you one thing that happened just yesterday. Now, that's been a long time since uh, I've been out of school now 10 years. Right. This is my 10th year uh -huh. away from the classroom with 31, that's 31 and 10, 41 years yeah. involved. Yeah. And then eight in between that. Uh -huh. And then the marriage and building home before that. Yeah. So it's been a fruitful life. Yeah. But I saw a man, I went to uh, host an affair for the first black postmaster in Wilkes County ever. Mm -hmm. And I served as the hostess, hostess for him while they formally received him. Mm -hmm. And one of the gentlemen walked in and he looked at me and he said, you don't remember me. I said, perhaps I don't, but somebody looks like you, somebody I've known. He said, do you remember Renee? And I said, Renee Bird, yes. My son and my daughter were children in your class. 